In 1950, 40% of the world's petroleum was being produced in Iran. In 1951, the Iranian National Assembly voted to nationalize all Iranian oil production. A national Iranian oil company is formed. Britain's attempts to secure oil for her country worried the United States, as concerns that Iran, now desperate from Britain's economic sanctions, turn to the Soviet Union for help. When Britain's sanctions work, the U.S. is even more alarmed. The oil exported by Iran drops from 31 million tons in 1950 to 118,000 tons, less than three years later. America is further enticed into action when politicians in Britain argue that any further Iranian economic growth would allow communism to infiltrate the Iranian government. England asks, the U.S. for Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh to be removed from power, and soon afterwards Mossadegh becomes desperate. Mossadegh says, look, you keep me in power and I will guarantee America a 40% discount on all, on all oil from our country. Either that or I will have no choice but to sell my oil to China and Russia. The ironic thing here is that Mosaddegh is actually a starch anti-communist. He hasn't even considered interacting with the Soviet Union, much less selling them oil. Until this point, the United States' fear of communism has actually driven Mosaddegh closer to communism than ever before. The CIA gives Kermit Roosevelt, grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, the task of executing the coup, now christened Operation Ajax. So Ajax has four main parts. Uh, the first part is a huge propaganda campaign, making Mossadegh out to be a communist. Uh, and then with American dollars, uh, opposition parties were encouraged to cause disturbances and to pressure Mossadegh to be removed from power. The first coup fails. Roosevelt then hires a mob of Iranians that pretend to be communist protesters and to head to Mossadegh's palace. There, with the assistance of police, who have already been paid off, the protesters in the Shah's army attack the palace guards and remove the democratically elected president from power by force. 300 palace guards and rioters are killed in the process. All of this was because British Petroleum wanted to secure its oil interests. British Petroleum doesn't only have a history of spilling oil, but also blood. The oil in the Middle East does not stay so disorganized for much longer. In 1960, numerous oil producing countries formed OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. OPEC's goal is to make sure that all of the countries in the Middle East and South America that are exporting oil are working with each other to make maximum profits. Instead of one country cutting its prices to increase the demand of its oil and lower the interest in the more expensive oil from other countries, instead of Kuwait gaining a huge share of the market by cutting the cost of its oil by say five dollars a barrel. Now every member of OPEC is exporting its oil at an agreed upon sixty-five dollars a barrel. October 6th, 1973, the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. Egyptian forces plunge toward the Sinai Peninsula and cross the Suez Canal on the 7th of October. The newly elected president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, felt squeezed as a moderate leader between the conservative, Muslim, and anti-Israeli leaders of other Middle Eastern countries. When his peace agreement around the Golan Heights was bitterly rejected by Israel, the cornered Sadat lashed out with force. By the 9th of October, Oshi Dayan, the Israeli Minister of Defense, openly warned of Israel's need to use nuclear weapons to prevent a total defeat. Moshe Dayan at first is subtle about the need to use nuclear weapons. He calls for the, the need to protect the Third Temple, using the code name for nuclear weapons, Temple, uh, in his talks in America. And he talks about last resort, and then on October 9th, he calls for the assembly of 13 20 kiloton atomic weapons uh, in, in preparation for a nuclear strike. Uh, Richard Nixon sees how desperate the Israelis are and in an attempt to deter the use of nuclear weapons, sets out to, to aid Israel. Nixon calls for Operation Nickel Grass, an American airlift to replace all of Israel's damaged or destroyed vehicles and equipment. However, the challenge of refueling the planes foreshadows the consequences of the decision. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger tries to get airfields in Europe where the cargo planes can, can land to refuel. But the countries of Europe are so afraid of an oil embargo that only two airfields accept the American planes for landing and refueling. Portugal allows for American C-5 galaxies 
to land and refuel at a base leased by Portugal in the Azores. The Dutch Prime Minister, without consulting his cabinet, secretly let the Americans use Dutch airfields to refuel. But the European countries were right in the possibility of an embargo on October 19th after President Nixon calls for $2.2 billion in appropriations for Israel. Saudi Arabia announces an oil embargo on the United States and many European countries and is followed by many other OPEC nations. The 1973 energy crisis begins. This is NBC Nightly News, Wednesday, October 17th. Reported by John Chancellor. Good evening. The Middle East war produced developments all over the world today. The oil producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. The oil exporting nations only benefit from this embargo as the price of oil skyrockets by over $10 a barrel per year for the next eight years. One of the nations that benefits most from this is Iran. With Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi at the reins, Iran becomes the richest country in the Middle East. And the United States supports Iran through this in hopes that with American support, Iran will grow to become a beacon of stability in the region that has been torn apart by recent conflicts. The Shah had attempted a series of economic and social reforms and was, for the most part, quite successful. Income per capita and literacy were both at the highest they had ever been. And a new, affluent middle class found a home in the Iranian capital of Tehran. However, underneath the positive changes, trouble was brewing. You have a few things that, that combine to get this volatile revolutionary mixture. Uh, you have peasants without the land they were guaranteed with this supposed land reform program. You have the, the bourgeois type situation where many intellectuals and middle class are unemployed and badly affected by massive inflation. And you have the religious aspect. Devout Muslims are disgusted with this new Iranian society, which is based upon greed and materialism, as well as the rampant government corruption in the Shah's administration. Opposition elements begin to use terrorism in an attempt to get what they want. Their targets are mostly wealthy Iranians or rich foreigners. This incites even more revolutionary ideas, when the Savak, the Shah's US trained police, strike back with appalling brutality against the dissidents. When your friends and neighbors are being tortured or imprisoned by your government because of their cause, it will definitely start changing the way you think about both the revolution and your government, especially with Khomeini guiding you on the revolutionary path. Leading the charge against the Shah is Ayatollah Ruhola Khomeini, a Shiite cleric who broadcasts attacks against the Shah's regime over radio, television, and newspapers, all from exile in Paris. When the government finally collapses in 1979, Khomeini rushes in to head a new Islamic Republic, which is instead dominated by Shiites, who impose traditional Islamic law. You know, the after effects of a, a revolution similar really to Robespierre's Reign of Terror, in which the suspected supporters of the Shah are rounded up public and, and, and publicly executed. Uh, but the most terrified of all are the Americans. In the eyes of Ayatollah, America was the great Satan who protected Israel and fought Muslims everywhere. In addition, the OPEC embargo taught Iranians that they could affect America. And they did. On October 22, 1979, President Carter, despite the State Department's warnings of repercussions, permitted the Shah, who was at this point hated by most Iranians, to be admitted to the Cornell Medical Center to be treated for lymphoma. In response, on November 4, 1979, the Muslim student followers of the Imam's Line, a Muslim revolutionary group dedicated to Khomeini, gathered to protest outside the gates of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. As they had planned that morning, one student pulls out metal cutters from her chador and cuts the locks on the embassy gates. Within minutes, almost 1,000 angry protesters are inside the gates of the embassy. Upon entering the embassy building, they capture over 60 embassy workers. Military police guards and CIA officers bind their hands, blindfold them, and hold them hostage. 
Their plan originally was to, to hold the embassy for a few hours, send a message. Um, and when Romania approves of this, the hostages continue to be held by the students. Along with claims from the hostage takers that they were sympathetic to minorities, 13 women and African Americans were released in the middle of November. Another hostage was released in July of 1980 to be treated for multiple sclerosis. The other two 52 hostages were held for a total of 444 days until America and Iran agreed on a settlement that would include the release of around $8 billion of Iranian assets that had been frozen in the United States. The hostages were flown out of Iran while President Ronald Reagan was being sworn into office and days after the Iran-Iraq war had started. Iran had changed the balance of power in the West, in the course of the world economy, and the outcome of a presidential election all in less than 30 years.